everyone um, and welcome to the fifth uh, CARE online talk. Uh, this one is focusing on Sweden. Um, my name is Martin Bogdan. Uh, I work at the Academic Cooperation Association as a project officer and um, I hope we'll have a really nice uh, presentations and uh, discussion today. Um, before I before I start presenting the project, uh, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, I would like to remind everyone to stay muted and to keep your cameras turned off. And uh, we will also have uh, a dedicated time for discussion when where we invite all the participants to join. Uh, you can join in by using the raise hand function or typing your name into the chat box and you will be, be given the floor and you can also uh, join via the uh, camera and the microphone since we are in a Zoom meeting and not, uh, not a Zoom, Zoom webinar function. Um, so having said that, uh, I can uh, start with uh, presenting the, uh, the CARE project. Uh, CARE is uh, the project uh, uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 Science for Refugees uh, funding line. It started in January 2019 and it is finishing this year. Its main objective is to support the integration of researchers uh, with a refugee back background into the European um, research labor market. Um, we're doing this through the, through, uh, by providing needs-based guidance and provision of relevant information to the uh, researchers in various countries in Europe, uh, more specifically in the 10, 10 target countries, uh, which are listed on the slide. Um, they were decided based on the number of applications and positive decisions of asylum applications, unemployment rates, uh, and R&D personnel and the share of R&D personnel in the uh, country's uh, labor market. Um, the project is uh, run by ACA, Academic Cooperation Association in Brussels, and our partners, uh, EAD from Germany and uh, EDUFI from Finland. Um, our, uh, so a little bit about ACA, we are an umbrella organization working in Brussels, partly as a representation of national agencies working in international internationalization of higher education, and partly as a think tank and a policy uh, institute. Uh, our members are listed here on the, on the slide. Um, and with the uh, care timeline and main activities, I would like to present you where are we currently standing now in the project. Um, so um, we started by identifying, identifying key stakeholders at the European level. Um, and then we continued by actually doing uh, focus groups with the, with the target group, uh, which are uh, researchers with a refugee background and also scholars, uh, scholars at risk, researchers at risk. Um, these focus groups were conducted in each of the target countries where we were uh, basically listening to their experiences, mapping the needs and competencies to see how to proceed further. Uh, and in parallel, uh, we were conducting an employer survey um, to see on the other hand, what are the needs and the uh, what are the needs and the situation among the employers in these uh, European countries. Uh, we were focusing on public sector, but also on many, um, also on many uh, private uh, companies and uh, industries throughout throughout Europe. Um, based on the focus groups and the employer surveys, uh, we've compiled uh, two reports uh, with an additional report, which is uh, comprising both of the findings. Uh, these uh, reports are shared uh, in the chat. So I uh, warmly welcome everyone to have a look and to see the results that we've that we've gathered. Uh, and based on based on these results, we are currently finalizing the country guides for the specific for the specific countries, where in the country guides, we will uh, put all of this uh, information together. So they will uh, be available for the target group, but also for the uh, professionals working, working in the field. Uh, the country guides are in their final phase of uh, development, and they will be published uh, publicly um, within a week or two. So um, for this, uh, please follow, follow our Twitter channel and uh, email correspondence, and we will be happy to share all of this uh, publicly. Uh, in parallel with the country guides, we are also conducting these online talks, uh, for which this is the fifth one. And we're currently in the middle, uh, in the middle of the stream because we are uh, conducting one online talk per country. 
Um, so today we will be talking about Sweden, but uh, we are also covering all the other countries where we are also uh, listening to the experiences from uh, professionals working in the field, but also from the researchers themselves uh, who are uh, invited to share their experiences and discuss uh, on this on these topics. Um, we will finish with uh, with the final EU level webinar uh, sometime uh, mid November. Um, so now we can uh, go to Sweden, where we are, which is the focus of the today's of the today's online talk. Um, so a little bit from the to just to start the discussion, I would like to present the key findings from the focus groups where we talked with the. Uh, researchers and then the employer survey where we mapped the needs uh, of the of the employers. Um, so the researchers basically as in many uh, in many other countries in Europe uh, were talking about difficulties in finding permanent positions in academia. Uh, there are also language barriers mostly focusing on the local lang language and also difficulties moving from academia to the private sector and uh, I'm very eager to hear more about this today uh, from one of uh, from one of our speakers uh, about Sweden um, then also as in many as in many Euro European countries this label of the refugee researcher or, or a refugee scholar uh, is uh, considered problematic to many of them as they see themselves uh, being viewed less as a less as a researcher but more as uh, more, more as a refugee actually uh, which undermines their um, researcher status uh, in their opinion. Um, some of the needs and recommendation, recommendations they've put forward is the need for more networks, uh, better EU level regulation and funding, and also more funding and mentoring pro programs on the, on the country level. Um, on the other hand, the employers who've uh, filled in the survey are uh, focusing on a lot of positive impacts and incentives actually for hiring refugee background researchers in Sweden. Uh, they focus on professional skills of the candidates, uh, their language skills, mostly of their uh, mother language, and also uh, contributing to the internationalization of research and uh, workplace. Um, some of the obstacles that they were that they that the employers were facing are the levels of uh, candidates' professional skills, uh, foreign language proficiencies, and also uh, issues with rec uh, recognition of uh, qualifications and level of host uh, country language. Uh, in this case, that would be Sweden. Um, so this was just to get the role. Uh, uh, get the ball rolling and I would like to introduce uh, the speakers uh, today and I'm very happy that we have uh, with us uh, Carolina Catoni from the University of Gothenburg, Eva Glaumann from Jobspranget uh, initiative which is uh, linking uh, academics and researchers with the private sector and also uh, a researcher with a refugee background Leila Papoli Yazdi from uh, University of uh, Gothenburg. Um, so we'll, we'll start uh, our online talk with uh, Carolina Catoni from University of Gothenburg, uh, where she is an international relations officer and an assisting uh, director at the International Center at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, Carolina is the project manager for the work with scholars at risk at the institution, but also chairs the scholars at risk net network uh, in, the, in Sweden. Um, this includes uh, 21 uh, Swedish higher education institutions and Carolina also has experience uh, with uh, coordinating pilot program for newcomers with the PhD and with doctoral uh, incomers. Uh, so Carolina, welcome. Uh, it's uh, great to have you in this online talk uh, and I invite you please to uh, present us uh, the work you've been doing uh, at the University of Gothenburg at, uh, and at uh, Scholars at Risk. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, and thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. As Martin said, my name is Carolina Catoni. I'm working at the University of Gothenburg. I'm also sharing the Swedish section of Scholars at Risk, SAR Sweden. So today I will start with a brief introduction uh, to the Swedish research landscape and then move on to career paths within Swedish academia. And I will then devote the majority of my time by describing how Swedish universities are working with the Scholars at Risk program. And then I will end by giving a few tips and tricks on how to approach academia. Okay, so we start with the Swedish research landscape. Just to see that I have my notes in. So in international comparisons, um, Sweden is investing largely in research and development and has a high research intensity. Sweden is also one of the five countries in the OECD with the greatest number of research in relation to the population. So intensity research and also a lot of researchers um, in Sweden. 
So where is the research then taking place? Well, up to 70% of the actual research in Sweden is conducted at private companies and the university sector therefore stands for the remaining 30%. And if you look at how the governmental funding for research is distributed, only 50% of the funding for research goes directly to the universities. And the other 50% is distributed to governmental research agencies where researchers are applying for funding in national competition. And considerable part of research is also funded um, via grants from a broad spectrum of funding bodies in Sweden and abroad. So it could be companies, local government, public and private foundations and organization, and also not least by the EU framework program for research, which also includes the European Research Council, the ERC. Um, so applying for research funding is therefore a very big part of the role as a researcher at a higher education institution. At some Swedish universities, this external research funding, both national and international European, stands for the majority on the, of the income on the, on the research side. I listed here a, a few of the public research foundation, VR, Pharmas, Forte and Vinova and as well as some of the private research foundation, RG, Riksbankens Jubileumsfond, SSF and Wallenberg. And uh, of course, all of these you can read more about in detail in the, in the country guide that Martin mentioned earlier. Okay, so if we move on to, um, to career paths within Swedish academia. I just wanted to give you an overview of these career parts within Swedish academia in order for you to understand the different roles and also how you can apply for the different positions. So only 30% of all employed researchers in Sweden are working within higher education. And within Swedish academia, approximately one third of the positions are temporary positions, both within teaching and, and research. So the position marks with an asterisk in the, in the, here in the slide are those positions that are career development positions. And these positions are temporary and aims at giving the teacher or researcher the possibility to qualify scientifically as well as, as, well as pedagogically. So I just wanted to say a few words on the postdoc. Uh, I am assuming that you're all familiar with the concept, but the postdoc offered advanced training to help the new researcher to develop new skills and become more independent. And it's a form of career development position. And a postdoc position in Sweden, they are more common within science and technology. And the career development positions are overall more common within the STEM areas. I will get back to that later on as well. Uh, just to, then we have the junior lecture, which is called adjunct in Swedish, and then the associate senior lecture, biträdande lektor. And the associate senior lecture is a four-year career development position with the possibility to be transformed into a permanent position. And then we have the senior lecture, lektor and professor. So um, <clears throat> when looking at the mapping of PhDs five years after they have gained their PhD, the majority of the researchers within social sciences, humanities and arts are senior lecturers, whereas within the STEAM, STEAM areas, um, they are mainly uh, doing a postdoc. And this also reflects the relation between the research and education. Within the disciplines with a more focus on education, it's more common to become a senior lecturer soon after the PhD, compared to the research intense disciplines where the postdoc and research positions are more common. Okay, so next slide, please. So scholars at risk is one way of finding a position at a university as a researcher at risk. SAR is an international network working to promote and protect academic freedom. The network has its secretariat in New York and has over 500 members internationally. And SAR is also giving protection to threatened scholars in need of an academic sanctuary at a higher education institution outside the home country and 300 scholars are annually provided sanctuaries or offered assistance through SAR. If we look at the Sweden, uh, Swedish, on the Swedish side, 21 out of 50 higher education institutions are members of SAR. So the majority of the big and broad universities are members. And together we form the Swedish section of Scholars at Risk that I am sharing 
And within SAR Sweden, we are jointly working to increase the number of at-risk academics in Sweden and to create a sustainable funding and support structure around the scholars. There is not a national funding scheme in place in Sweden to be compared to countries like Germany, where they have the Philip Schwartz Initiative, and in France, where they have the POST program. But we are currently, we have had a co-funding scheme for some of the disciplines, and we're working towards a co-funding schemes for Swedish universities that could be a sustainable solution. Currently, we there are six SAR scholars hosted in Sweden, and compared to many other countries, this is a very low number. And this could partly be explained by the lack of national funding scheme. Um, but on the other hand side, there is an increased activity, activity level among the Swedish universities. There's big engagement and interest among Swedish universities. And also the question has started to gain uh, interest also at the university leadership, which, which is crucial for, for these questions. So the idea with the national section is also to create a bigger network for those scholars hosted in Sweden so that they could both use the 20 other members as a resource during their placement, but also that the second placement hopefully could be arranged within the section so that a scholar could be transferred to another university after the first placement if they cannot, be, um, if they cannot go back to their home country. There is also a cooperation between the national sections of SAR, and we are, for example, cooperating closely within the Nordic countries when it comes to hosting of SAR scholars. Um, SAR Sweden is also taking part in an EU-funded project called Inspire Europe, where 10 partner organizations are working to create a cooperation platform for researchers at risk within Europe. And the idea is to provide career support for researchers and also to influence policies, for example, regarding funding schemes for researchers at risk. The project are running numerous webinars for both potential employers, but also for, for, for scholars. For example, the next webinar will be on academic publishing for scholars and is planned uh, for October 21st. And I know that Suzanne will put the web link in the, in the chat for you as well. Okay, so the next slide, please, if you look into hosting at the Swedish universities. Um, well, hosting at the university outside the home country is offered to those scholars that have been part of an assessment process and that are considered to be at risk academics. So even though that the hosting is done at the university, the risk assessment is always made by experts at the SAR secretariat. So when a university is interested in hosting a scholar, a matchmaking process is starting between SAR, the scholar and the hosting university. And the matching and the mutual interest is very important in order to create a good hosting uh, milieu for the scholar. And I will get back to this as well. The positions are in most cases one year long at my own university and several other Swedish universities. There, there is a possibility of prolonging for an additional year. The positions and the proportions between research and teaching are adapted to the needs and conditions of each scholar. Um, some are devoting their entire time to research, where others are dividing their time between teaching and research. Well, getting back to the importance of the matching, and this is related to the professional development of the scholar. It is important that the time for the hosting of scholars is used in a smart way in order for the scholar to continue to develop, to build a new network, to take part of the professional development within the hosting institution. And that could be language, pedagogy, it could be how to attract a research funding, for example. Publish papers um, and training in publish internationally in, in a peer reviewed process is also important for those scholars that, are, that have only the experience in publishing in, in a regional perspective. The academic mentors at the hosting department, they are therefore key to take part in both co-publications and to apply for external funding. But the hosting of scholars is also, of course, a great benefit for the hosting institutions in terms of having a qualified scholar contributing to both education and research and coming with new perspectives into the subject area. Okay. So if we look at the last slide and on tips and tricks, um, 
all available positions within Swedish higher education institution needs to, by law, be announced publicly and often also, often also internationally. And this means that there is a high competition for jobs within Swedish academy, academia. Um, the first one is start with what you have at hand. So if you have a PhD, start by having your education validated. If you have only publications in other languages than English, to start to see if it might be relevant to translate some of them into English. And the same goes for if you have a recent PhD, but no publications in English, maybe parts of your PhD could be transformed into a shorter paper in English. The second bullet point is building on your existing competence, and it goes hand in hand with the, with the former bullet point. So what are your greatest assets as a researcher? Your PhD has given you many competences that can easily be transferred into the labor market, uh, either within academia or outside. And the research institutes, smaller higher education institutions are generally less competitive than the big and traditional universities. The third one is do your home code homework. So are you interested in a specific part of the labor market? Well, do your homework about that specific part. Contact the employer or potential employer and ask what competences they are looking for when employing. Use the website of the organization to do your research about the employer and use your cover letter to also highlight your soft skills and competences that you have gained, gained through your PhD education and relate those to the actual workplace. The fourth one is the network. Um, comes up every time uh, when talking to, to both uh, students and staff. Use every occasion to network. Take part in available mentoring programs. Um, the country guide will also highlight some of the existing mentoring programs. And open seminars to both keep up to date within your subject area in research, but also to continue to develop and keep updated on the labor market. And within this period, when we are mostly working remotely, uh, there are numerous Zoom webinars and, and, and virtual uh, seminars, both on the research side and, and on other initiatives that you could take part in. The last one is flexibility. So be flexible in terms of what kind of jobs you're applying for within your field. Sometimes a certain position can be transformed into another in due time. And experience from the actual workplace can be a great merit when new positions are announced. A traineeship could sometimes be a key to practical experience within the field. And also PhD competence is often asked for in administrative positions within the higher education sector. So again, highlight the competences gained through the PhD that are not only the formal competence within your field of research, but the more soft skills. And also don't forget that the biggest research activities are not taking place only within the university, but also outside. So look widely for ways to use your competences as a researcher within academia or outside. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carolina. It was really, uh, it was really fruitful to hear your presentations and I can just underline that uh, most of the Pressing issues that you've uh, that you've mentioned are all, were also uh, were, were also covered at uh, our focus groups and through the employer survey. So I'm also now after uh, after uh, five webinars and talking to people in uh, different European countries, I can only underline that these uh, many of these challenges are shared all across the board uh, in Europe, which uh, I mean uh, I'm, I'm sure you're also familiar with. Uh, and also um, thank you for emphasizing the importance of the national of the national scheme because when we look at uh, the numbers uh, in Germany or in France who have these uh, national support programs compared to other ones, I mean we can see a really a big uh, really a big difference. Uh, in numbers, so I, I really hope that you will you will manage to to push for the to push for the for the scheme at the Swedish national level. So, thank you very much. Um, if there's any immediate quick quick question, I I, I can give the floor. Um, uh, also, thank you very much, uh, Olivier, uh, for a good example to follow, um, an Italian example. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have a look. But uh, if there are not uh, immediate questions, no immediate questions, I would uh, move on uh, to our next speaker, uh, Eva Glaumann. Um, 
So I would like to introduce uh, Eva, who is the deputy head of uh, Job Spranget at the uh, Royal Ac Academy of Engineering Sciences. Um, Job Spranget uh, is basically the largest internship program for newcomer academics in Sweden, uh, with uh, 250 participating uh, employers. Uh, and Job Spranget has uh, a track record and uh, and excellent results uh, where seven out of 10 of their participating can candidates are offered jobs after the internships. Uh, so I'm pretty impressed uh, with these results and I'm uh, really curious to hear more. Um, so Eva, welcome uh, and please the floor is yours. So if you could present us. Yeah. Thank you very much and good morning everyone. Uh, I've just uh, set up a couple of links and I've added them in the chat room so they're available for all of you. This so my name is Eva Glaumann, Eva in English, and I also work for something called Eva. So I'm not referring to myself when I say that. And I'm working for the Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences in Sweden. So we can just change to the next slide. I would just like to mention the Royal Academy uh, of Engineering Sciences shortly. It's actually the world's oldest uh, engineering academy. Uh, it was founded 100 years ago and we celebrated that last year in 2019. And this is an academy, a meeting place where we gather academia, business and um, uh, politicians to uh, create and develop projects that have a uh, great influence and development on society. All together, we are, uh, they are 1300 fellows who have been elected to the academy, both on a national level and also international. And we also have a company network of 230 companies. And these two in combination create a very valuable platform when we build an internship program that Job Sprunget has become. So this uh, seminar is completely about Job Sprunget. So we dive into that. So the next slide, please. So what is Job Sprunget? It is an internship program. We have two semesters per year, spring and autumn. And it means that our candidates do a four month internship at one of the participating employers in the program. We reach out to five different uh, academic groups, engineers, so technology, architecture, scientists, uh, business finance area, and also pharmacists. So we have tried that as a pilot uh, since uh, 2019. And what we would like to do is to speed up the integration and uh, to the Swedish labor market. Because currently it takes far too long time for these academic groups to actually enter the labor market in Sweden. So uh, we do that through internship. And the program was founded in 2016. And that was especially when we had the refugee crisis in the world. And a lot of people came to Sweden. 160,000 people were seeking asylum for that year in Sweden. So shortly about the results of the program. Next slide, please. The results are fantastic. We see, like you heard in the introduction, that seven out of 10 are offered an employment after the internship. 50% of the candidates participating are women. And this actually shows that internship, uh, which is a very easy method, can speed up the introduction to the labor market. So instead of five years that it can take today, or almost up to 10 years, we can do this in four months instead. The program is uh, funded by the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation and also the Wallenberg Foundation. It's been run since 2016, and it's also here to stay. So we're aiming for uh, continuing another five years from now on. Next slide, please. So you might wonder, what do we do that speeds up the time to employment? Well, first of all, uh, we have an application portal that's uh, built by Jobsbronget. And this portal contains all the internship positions offered in the program. So candidates who are interested in doing an internship can apply directly to these positions. And by doing that, they are getting in touch with the employers directly as well. What we said is that Swedish should not be mandatory. That means the language. So we have removed that. And instead we say we do this in English. 
because you can do an, an internship in accounting, controlling, engineering, construction, etc. in English. But what we do is that we do the internship in English and we socialize in Swedish. So we have it all together called Swinglish. Last but not least, a candidate does not have, need to have its um, university degree having been validated by the Swedish authority. We mean that an employer will meet the candidate for an interview. And then in addition to the internship, that's a great way of validating this candidate's skills. So these all together speeds up the time to employment. Next slide, please. And you can press one more time. <laughs> Thank you. So the key to success is to get the employers on board. So the companies, the municipalities, the authorities uh, and other employers who are interested in participating on board. So how do we do that? Well, I mentioned the application system. That's one way that we help them so that they don't need to ask for CVs from the Swedish Employment Agency. The employers and candidates, they meet directly in the application portal. Number two, we have national collaborations. So with whom? First of all, we have with the Swedish Public Employment Agency. And that is very important because all the candidates are registered at this agency when they apply for jobs and when they have received a permit. So they are part of an activity program and in that program they can do internship. So that where it puts it fits together with the Obstbrunget, the internship program. We also have a national collaboration with four unions who are um, part of the Obstbrunget and also say that this is a good program that helps these candidates to take the next step. And third of all, the mentor support. And now you can switch slides, please. You might believe that the mentor support is a very long education or it takes a lot of time to do that, but not at all. Uh, we do this as a digital meeting for one and a half hours. And during that meeting, we meet the supervisors from the different employers. And we go through different parts and highlights of the four coming months during the internship. Also, we especially focus on um, something called employability. And Carolina was actually touching upon that. And one of the key things here is to network. In Sweden, seven out of eight jobs or seven out of 10 jobs are actually gotten through a network. So we ask the mentors at the employers to encourage the interns, the candidates, to network as much as possible, to apply to as many jobs as possible. And by doing that, they also increase their so-called employability. So what I'm showing here is the mentor program. And you also see a link to that one in the chat. And you also have a guide for the intern, the candidate. And that's also linked in the chat room. Next slide, please. So the employers who commit to participate, they have to do three things. Appoint a mentor, uh, give relevant internship tasks for someone on an academic level, of course, and they have to meet at least one candidate per internship position that they advertise. So why do we have that criteria? It doesn't always turn out to be an internship position that is filled, but we want them to meet for the interview because normally in that meeting, that is when the magic happens. The candidate gets to present him herself and explain what he she wants to do and what they can contribute with to the company or the employer, that is. So these are the three criteria in order to participate as an employer. Next slide, please. So we're living in a global time and we have, of course, the Agenda 2030 goals. And Jobsprunget uh, fits perfectly with some of these goals. So if you press once again, you will see it's number four, quality education, five, gender equality. We have 50-50% in the program, eight, decent work and economic growth, because we see that many continue to work and 10 reduced inequalities. And these are specified a bit further 
in the presentation material on the next slide. With respect to time, I will not go into those details here. So we can continue to the last slide. So where are we located and how many are participating? So we have 250 participating employers in 50 different locations all over Sweden. So it's a nationwide program nowadays. And already from the first semester, we were actually offering internship in 10, 10 different locations uh, almost all over Sweden. So these are employers both from the public sector, that can be the municipalities, authorities, for example, or from the private sector, large companies that are stock listed, or also small medium enterprises. And they all have something in one thing in common. They are looking for these skills and competences, and they would love to work more with um, sustainability. So this program meets both of those demands and wishes, and it's a very easy and um, accessible model for them to apply. We've had 950 candidates since the program started in 2016, and the program is just growing for each semester now. And despite COVID, we're doing our best results ever since we started. So I just think we're on the beginning of this fantastic journey. With that, everyone, I would like to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I would love to answer these for you, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Eva. Uh, Eva, sorry, in English. Um, uh, very impressive uh, results indeed, and I really hope that uh, I really hope that this uh, this will be helpful for for some of the uh, researchers also uh, with a with a refugee background. And um, when I was uh, listening to your presentation, I just uh, was thinking about how this would be a very uh, useful initiative here in Flanders, actually, where a lot of the uh, a lot of the challenges that you uh, resolved successfully are still pressing here. So uh, I might uh, send them a few links uh, that you've shared. Um, I can also uh, invite uh, the audience for an immediate question, uh, if there is one uh, which can be answered uh, shortly. Uh, but if uh, not. Uh, I would uh, leave the questions for the for the discussion after our um, final speaker, um, and our final speaker is uh, Leila Papoli uh, Yazdi uh, from uh, let's say kind of a different spectrum uh, of the research uh, landscape. So as uh, Eva was focusing more about uh, the STEM areas, the the uh, economics, and Leila's background is in humanities, uh, which have uh, I'm sure that uh, everyone is very familiar with quite a different uh, quite a different career paths and different opportunities to to find uh, employment uh, so i'm also very happy that we can cover uh, this this as well um Leila is a scholar, scholars at uh, risk uh, uh, researcher at the Department of uh, Historical Studies at the University of Gothenburg, um, and uh, she was suspended from her job as a university professor per professor after uh, the 2009 post-election conflicts uh, in Iran. Um, she worked as an archaeologist of the recent past, and also she was uh, she was uh, leading uh, several research projects internationally in Pakistan, Kuwait, and Iran, and the main teams. Of of her work are oppression, gender, colonialis uh, colonization, and violence. Um, and her uh, archaeological studies of political opposition and nationalism are pioneering in Iran. Uh, so Leila, welcome. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And please, if you could share your experiences and also some of the reflections on what has been said so far, uh, I really look forward to it very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like first to appreciate the organizers for this event. And um, it's a, a great honor for me to share some of my experiences here. Um, please uh, change this slide if possible. Thank you. Um, I am an Iranian archaeologist. Um, I lost my job in 2009 and then uh, again in 2012. And um, um, then one day I felt very safe in my countries so I applied uh, for a scholar at risk and then um, I got an email from the University of Gothenburg and um, I should admit that uh, you know from um, the last decade I knew uh, some of the colleagues here 
at the University of Gothenburg. And uh, um, I knew that the Department of Historical Studies here is one of the best uh, in Europe. So um, it was a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, work at the University of Gothenburg and I accepted it. And then I um, uh, um, arrived to Sweden in uh, winter 2019. Um, here, I would like to uh, answer some of uh, these questions, as you see here, and um, then uh, I will um, uh, give you some tips and messages for a successful integrations from my own perspective. Uh, please the change the slide, please. Yes, um, so it was winter 2019 when I arrived uh, to Sweden. And um, someone was waiting for me at the airport. It was really hot, warming, and uh, I then um, he helped me to uh, reach to the apartment, which was provided by university for me. And then my life here uh, started. Uh, could you please change the? So. Um, in February 2019, I started my career at the Department of uh, Historical Studies. Um, in the first days, um, you will find that uh, it's very easy in Sweden to speak English and even in your mother language. So um, there are um, um, like 85% of Swedes who can speak English perfectly. And uh, there are also several events, seminars in the um, city as well as the university, which are being held in English. Uh, and also most of the websites you need to um, check, uh, they have English uh, pages. So it's no problem to start with English, but if you decide to stay in uh, Sweden and to integrate uh, with academia, I recommend you to uh, learn uh, Swedish because uh, disputations, department meetings, and department emails are all in English. And besides, if you want to um, find friends, learn the cultures, and to communicate uh, with broader... Sorry. Um, people, uh, you need uh, to uh, learn the language. Uh, there are uh, courses uh, offering by the university uh, that um, you can learn um, uh, Swedish there. And also there are classes outside the university, which are uh, called SFE, Svenska for Imandare. Uh, and uh, both are free. Um, uh, first, uh, I attended in um, a university classes and then I uh, applied for SFE. Uh, it will take some months uh, for you to find a place in SFE, but I think it's worth because um, there you can um, uh, learn um, Swedish very fast and based uh, on uh, very um, updated methods. Uh, the other thing is that if you want to uh, teach at the university, uh, you have to pass some courses at the um, Department of Pedagogy, uh, which, are called, which are called teaching um, uh, courses. And um, if uh, it's your goal to stay in Sweden and teach, then you have to pass these courses. Okay, please change the slide. <clears throat> yes, but academic life in Sweden for someone uh, who is from the outside is a little bit different uh, from the other um, you know, academic uh, environments. I have worked before in uh, Germany and France, so um, I, uh, and also in Pakistan, I'm, uh, and I have a base uh, to compare all these uh, environments. So um, here in Sweden, uh, working as a researcher um, I would put some uh, duties on your uh, shoulders even more than the other context. Um, so I, I recommend you uh, to uh, write um, a program for, from your side, from your viewpoints um, in the first days, and then speak about this program uh, with um, 
uh, vice uh, of the department or the head of the department. And then uh, you will have a basis uh, to schedule uh, your meetings, your seminars, and um, your uh, other works. Um, also, it's very important, I think, to uh, communicate with the people who are um, in the city uh, at the libraries, exhibitions, and I mean, from my point of view, because I am an archaeologist, museums, but you can find other places. Um, the libraries of the university um, are, um, I mean, very good places to uh, work in, at least before this pandemic. And they contain that much books that you uh, don't need to buy new ones. And uh, also there are uh, policies of uh, work environment, environment in Sweden that you should know. Uh, uh, in my case, I got um, very useful information in the first days uh, from uh, the security department of the um, uh, university, also uh, from uh, um, uh, Ms. Katoni and uh, also from welcome service and representatives of trade union at the uh, department. Uh, so, we, so you will get the information and you know that um, you uh, have this right to report all the uh, problems and um, issues you have uh, at work. Um, even you can ask for glasses, for um, uh, new monitors, for uh, computers, um, everything that help you to improve your work and uh, uh, but one of the very challenging uh, issues for the um, researchers at risk here is to learn how to write the applications so to have a funding for your researchers you have to write the application and i found it one of the most difficult uh, things here because i had uh, written some applications before and when i was in germany and um, I was uh, a postdoc fellow uh, at the Department of Archaeology and supported by Humboldt Stiftung, but um, it was, um, you know, um, still hard for me to um, write an application in the Swedish way. So uh, there are some courses and workshops uh, offered by the university uh, of Gothenburg, and I um, attended in some of them. And um, um, I um, uh, spent, uh, I mean, one year time to, um, to uh, learn how to write an application. Um, you uh, will um, get uh, so many helps in this um, um, way. For example, the um, section of research and initiative uh, of the university, and also the economists at the university will help you to schedule your budget, and your program. So there are helps, but um, it's a long way uh, still to uh, learn how to write um, um, an application. Uh, please change the uh, slide. Okay. But you will get also supports from um, many people at the universities. Uh, and I should um, admit that um, the first months for the school are at risk is very hard because uh, we, uh, when we uh, flee from our countries, we have lots of stress and anxiety and um, we have um, fears also. And um, um, actually, as it was said before, um, some of the uh, researchers, uh, when they are labeled as uh, refugees or a scholar as at risk, they feel that uh, they are being underestimated and they don't want to uh, be seen as refugees only. They want to be uh, seen as um, researchers. So it's um, really hard for the um, scholar at risk to um, uh, tolerate um, with this condition and uh, deal with the new uh, life. So they need the supports, I mean, um, uh, at least in the very first months. I, I got lots of supports from first international administrative officer um, uh, who is um, 
uh, at the our university, Carolina Catuni, and she was always available. I uh, could email her um, every time I had a problem, an issue. And um, also um, head of the department and the vice head of the department um, who are always available. And um, when I cannot understand something um, or I have uh, some issues, I just email them and I got answers and it's really, really effective. Um, and um, one of the um, uh, very um, effective things in uh, the academic life here in Sweden is um, the trade union. And uh, there are some representatives of trade unions at the department. And uh, I really recommend you, if you want to um, know more about your situation, speak with them and they will give you some tips about your rights and how to deal with your condition. Uh, so these are the supports that um, you will get from the university. Uh, but still, there are some issues. I think one of the very um, uh, problematic things in Sweden is healthcare system, that you should learn how to deal with it and how to handle your situation and your uh, sicknesses, uh, because it's a very complicated uh, system. Um, uh, um, and also, as I told you, writing applications is another thing that you should think of that. And as a scholar at risk, I think these very short term uh, jobs, it's really stressful. So um, um, as a researcher, you have to uh, deal with all of this and to, to learn how to uh, manage your stress because then uh, it will change your uh, life um, if uh, you cannot uh, handle them. Please change this slide. Okay, and what worked in my case, um, um, I mean, I had this opportunity that some of my articles um, had been discussed in academia courses of the University of Gothenburg for some years. Um, so um, um, some of the uh, professors here, here, they knew me and uh, I had met um, some of them uh, in uh, seminars and uh, conferences before. Um, so we knew each other for years. And uh, during my stay here, um, they um, offered me to teach uh, for the students. And uh, it was really effective for me uh, because I found new uh, ways of communication. I could um, um, train, uh, you know, again, I could uh, practice my language and uh, um, it was a um, great deal. Uh, but um, uh, I think that um, uh, the problem of me is uh, here is to find funding for my uh, researchers. So uh, coming here, I had some material culture uh, from uh, the very uh, last excavations I, I had and I published them. So now I need a new, um, actually a project. So, um, I mean, I had written applic an application last year and I had to write a new one this year. Um, could you please change the slide? Uh, yes. Um, I think that it's very important to always keep in mind that being a SAR um, um, a scholar doesn't mean to um, stay aside, but it's very important to uh, take part in the department and uh, to um, have communication and discussions with your colleagues. Um, so I think that being part of this department um, and uh, acting as a member um, is so important uh, for both sides, um, you as the researcher and the employer. Um, I think that uh, in Swedish ac academia, um, you can develop your ideas. Uh, creativity um, um, is being welcomed and accepted by the colleagues and the departments. Based on my experience, the departments will offer you any resources and uh, uh, facilities you need to work um, at your office and are your ideas. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, um, it's very important to uh, write um, your applications. 
Um, and um, how always in mind that your CV is very important, is your wealth here. So um, I um, recommend you to work on your articles, to publish them in English. Um, and uh, to have uh, you know, um, your part in the discussions and in the academia, an active uh, role. Uh, so um, one of my tips here is to be open to new approaches and methods because uh, creativity is something that uh, may save you from um, uh, remaining alone in the academia or just uh, being aside from the discussions. Um, the second one is a focus on improving your CV. Um, and uh, I think that it's very much important, publish and publish. And uh, the third one is uh, to write uh, applications. And um, I think it's one of the ways that uh, we can find our um, places uh, as a scholar at least um, um, in the uh, Swedish academia. And um, also, if we get um, these um, fundings, then uh, we, we can uh, develop our own projects. Uh, I know that the chance to get one is very low, but um, I think it was to um, focus on it. And uh, don't be shy, ask for help if you need it. Um, um, many of us are from the cultures, um, as I am, that uh, are very conservative and um, uh, we are shy. Uh, but I, it was one of the things that I learned here, uh, not to be shy and to ask for help and uh, to speak clearly about uh, the things I need and uh, on my request. Uh, Thank you very much for um, your time, and uh, I hope uh, my comments uh, uh, can help you. And uh, also, if there is any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, for this presentation. I think it was very, uh, very focused and very relevant for the for the needs of the target group. Um, so I would like to open the floor to the discussion now and to invite, invite all of the speakers to, to join. Um, so if there is uh, any question, please uh, raise, use the raise hand function uh, or type in the chat. Uh, we have a hand from, uh, we have a hand from uh, Eva, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Yeah, I just wanted to add to Leila's presentation, thank you for that, that uh, we have weekly seminars uh, on Jobsprunget and we've had it about CV coaching. So how you write like a good CV and it's different employers giving a perspective on that. And also update your LinkedIn profile and have a strategy on how you brand yourself on LinkedIn. So if these are in help uh, help for you, have a look there because it's the uh, the employers their own words on how they um, form it and what they are looking for and, and what they recommend in terms of CV writing. That's all. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Carolina is raising the the like. Um, if there is no question, I mean, I have one thing to to ask, maybe to to get uh, to get the discussion uh, going. Uh, Leila, by listening through your presentation, I was thinking you were saying how important the the support network you had was uh, the, that this was really really important for you when you arrived, and also through through the entire process for from the few few years. And this is something that is uh, often uh, missing uh, in many cases. Uh, and I think that's also one of the ways how to maybe uh how to maybe transition from different uh different maybe in brackets if we want to call them uh academic cultures uh, that maybe some of the some of the researchers are used to and to the ones where they are uh, working now and uh, you've also mentioned how important it was for you to be uh in touch uh, with uh, carolina who we have here and this was like the, this was the most helpful thing and i'm thinking if uh, maybe you have uh, either of you or maybe uh, eva also if you have some uh, reflections on the thing how to uh, make this uh, a systemic uh, a systemic uh, thing and not uh, dependent on only one person and maybe their goodwill to to assist but maybe how to build from this like a uh, support system um, if anyone wants to comment on this um, okay. I would like to say but it is a systemic problem uh, as well 
Uh, and it's um, a lot of prejudice out there amongst the employers. So we have to persuade them that they have to dare taking this step. And in the second line, it's the candidates who can work on like their employability skills. So you can do that through networking, improving your CV, uh, interview training, find different forums. And it can be social forums. It doesn't have to be professional forums, but the social forums can open the door for you to a professional network as well. So we have to work in two different lines and that what that's what Job Sprunget especially does, that we have the model for employers to work with sustainable sustainability in an easy way, which they might not normally be used to or have done before. I also think that the acad academia could learn a lot from the private sector when it comes to mentoring, uh, because I do agree uh, with you, Martin. It's, it's important to find a support structure that is not dependent on, on separate individuals, but it, that there is a like, structurized support structure. And I think you know, many of these questions uh, related to, to, to um, refugee researchers shows us that you know, this is nothing we a single organization or part in this cannot you know solve these uh, challenges alone but we need to act on this together so that's why these these kind of uh, european um, joint projects are so important but also that the sector not only the academic sector not only the private sector but jointly we need to to work together and i think we can learn a lot from the for example from the mentoring guides that eva showed in her presentations that we could could also have a look at within academia and, and um, develop according to our own uh, uh, conditions yeah i believe the biggest hurdle is just taking the first step and employers in Sweden, no matter if it's public or private sector, they are afraid of not being able to deliver a good program, for example. But I mean, look at COVID currently. You can, we have so many candidates who are doing an internship digitally. And by doing something, it's so much more than doing nothing. So that's very important to keep in mind that for the companies, they want to over deliver perhaps, or the employers, no matter if it's public or private, but just by taking a step and offering something is so much better than doing nothing for these candidates because they're looking for a um, possibility to just show what they can do. And they need that, uh, that opportunity to show their full potential. And currently they're not given, given them. Yes, thank you. I, I mean, I fully agree with everything, uh, with everything that was said. Uh, maybe Leila, if you have a comment on this or... No? Okay. Um, so if there's uh, any other question, um, please uh, use the raise, the raise hand function or write your name into the chat. Um, there have also been some links shared. Um, but also, um, ah, yes, we have a question. Um, Vihidual, please uh, go ahead. Uh, please feel free to turn on your camera and microphone if you wish so. Not, uh... Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, great. Uh, uh, I had one question. Currently, I live in Germany. I'm pursuing my master's degree in international management. Uh, I came actually from Afghanistan with the other scholarship. Uh, but my parents, uh, my mom actually lives in Stockholm. I came so many times here. What is the... Uh, possibility or the opportunities that I'm pursuing my master degree in here and doing work in uh, Stockholm. Is there uh, possibilities? Do you mean like continuing uh, PhD education or do you mean uh, uh, another job? No, uh, no, no, work, a uh, job. Uh, yeah, for the job. Do, do you want to comment on that, Eva, or, or do you want me to say something? You can start and I can f fill in with the rest, yeah. I think that, you know, um, uh, the um, there's a lot of job talent coming to, to Sweden um, and there's um, big attractivity um, among the um, 
among the companies when it comes to uh, employees with international experience. So uh, and so I think it's it, it it's a great idea and it's open. You know, normally if you're looking into the public sector, all, all positions are are normally international announced. Um, for some positions, it is important with uh, with knowledge in Swedish. But as Eva said, one of the uh, one of the strengths is also to look within the international companies that are not on, only requiring the the knowledge in Swedish. That is maybe more more used uh, as a social social way than it's needed for the actual provision, but it depends within which field you are. Yes, and if you would like to work in Sweden, so you need a work permit, first of all, and uh, participants... That was the main, uh, yeah, yeah, that was the main. Uh, yeah, so there are student permits and work permits, and you have uh, different possibilities depending on what permit you will have and what you can do thereafter. But for those candidates who have come to Sweden and have a work permit and have not yet received a job, and um, they can, after a certain amount of time that they have applied for jobs, also apply to an activity program of, such as Jobsprunget is one of the activities. But there are many other similar projects all over Sweden. So for doing the internship, you must have been in Sweden for a while and looking for jobs uh, with a work permit as a base. There are also some companies that are recruiting internationally and that are helping you with the work permit uh, once you have uh, received the, the job offer. So that is also another possibility. Thank you so much. Yes, I hope this was, this was helpful uh, to you. I mean, we, we haven't really touched base the work permits and other administrative uh, hurdles, but this is, I think, also a topic for... Uh, webinar itself but it's it's good to know that uh, that there are options uh, like Eva you've you've said uh, in Sweden like how to bypass this in a, a little bit to at least for a for a temporary uh, period um we can uh, i think we can slowly wrap up uh, since we've been uh, slightly over time um in any case um, so i would like to thank uh, everyone uh, thank you very much especially to our uh, speakers for sharing some really practical and i think really good uh, good examples of the uh, possibilities available but also of opening up some uh, some of the some of the key challenges that uh, still needs to be resolved some of them relate to uh, a swedish national level i would say but also a lot of them are uh, pan european and i think shared all across uh, the board and i think some uh, some joint work here here through uh, different uh, projects and initiatives uh, will uh, will result in 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 in, uh, in in new maybe funding lines or uh, or new programs that could support that could support uh, the target group. Um, I would also like to uh, invite everyone to have a look at our country guide uh, uh, in uh, approximately two weeks when it will be published uh, this will uh, uh, this will be shared on our uh, Twitter so please uh, so please follow it for this uh, and I can also announce uh, the upcoming uh, the upcoming online talks uh, for Finland on 19th of October Switzerland 28th of October and Netherlands for the 30th of October uh, with the closing of the of the online talk series uh, sometime in in, in mid-november uh, with the EU series uh, online talk uh, we will share the presentations uh, with the participants and also the recording will be available at our uh, YouTube channel uh, YouTube channel within a week. Um, so thank you very much uh, everyone. Uh, I, uh, I hope we've, uh, we've learned a lot uh, from each other uh, and uh, please if you want to stay in touch uh, our contacts are listed on the presentations and also the ones from the speakers. So also use this uh, online talk as an opportunity for so much needed networking. Thank you very much. Have a nice uh, have a nice afternoon and best regards from Brussels. <laughs>